tend to post it or replay on residio.com uh, in the coming days. With that, I'll hand it over to Residio Scott Harkins. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and welcome everyone to the best practices for essential home service providers during the COVID era town hall. Uh, we're really excited about the panel today. Uh, in fact, we've been inundated with questions over the past few weeks about how companies in both our HVAC channel and our security channel, how to, how to cope in this current business environment. The challenges are so unique that we thought pulling together a, a group of industry experts across both industries, uh, because we are both home services industries, would be a way to help you uh, maybe manage your business through the, the current pandemic. Um, the industry reception has been pretty good so far. We're expecting about uh, just over 2,000 companies to join, and I'm watching the numbers get higher and higher already as we speak. Before we get started, um, on behalf of Residio and all of the panelists, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone on the front line of the global pandemic, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, the medical personnel, uh, the people working at the grocery stores and delivering food at the drug stores for pharmaceuticals. Uh, they've all become essential workers these days, and uh, they're making tremendous sacrifices as we face this, this unprecedented uh, global health crisis. So uh, we thank them and you for your committed service. I also recognize that right now our, our industries are saturated with webinars. Um, we hope that this one is going to be a little bit different because it focuses on your daily challenges. Be assured this will not be an advertisement on behalf of Residio or our products or any of our panelists. Um, I'll be doing my job as a moderator well if you walk away having heard two or three things that maybe you can take back to your business later today or tomorrow um, that might help you find a bit more success in, in this difficult time. So uh, let's talk about the agenda for a moment. Really a very simple agenda today. Uh, I'm doing the welcome right now, so we'll be through that here in a second. We'll spend a couple of minutes getting introduced to our panelists but the overwhelming amount of time will be spent um, uh, taking questions or providing questions to the panelists and hearing about some of their best practices that they've implemented in their business to be successful in this time. Of course, we had a large group of people. We're already over uh, coming up on 1100 plus the, the 10 or 15 here as part of the panel. Um, and in a group this size, it's important that we adhere to legal guidelines and don't discuss topics like pricing or terms and conditions uh, or discounts or other items that might be in some way um, conflict with antitrust laws. So having said all of that, uh, we'll take a moment and introduce the presenters. I'll, I'll go first. My name is Scott Harkins. I lead uh, the sales and marketing organization for Residio across all of our channels. Um, I'm a, gosh, I've been in the, one of these two industries since 1988. Uh, so been in the home for my entire life working on one kind of service uh, or another. Uh, I'm excited to be the moderator today and really appreciate uh, this excellent group of panelists during the call today. So now we'll introduce the panelists. Jay, why don't you go first? Thank you, Scott. Uh, my name is Jay Autry. I'm with Great Sum Security. I head up customer care and the alarm response center. I've been in the industry um, a little over 20 years and I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Great, I'm Melissa Brinkman and CEO of Custom Alarm. We're in Rochester, Minnesota. We um, are a local trusted security partner here. We focus on fire alarm, security, access control, and um, video. And uh, our company, we've been protecting customers, residential and commercial for over 50 years. I've been in the industry and working here at Custom Alarm for a little over 20 years. And I'm also excited to be on this panel and look forward to hearing what the rest of the panelists have to share for good tips today. Thank you, Melissa. And a big thank you, Scott Harkins and your entire team for pulling a group like this together to be able to give some insight and guidance uh, during a time like this. So a huge thank you, greatly appreciated by uh, myself and I know many others on my team and uh, certainly others within our industry. Uh, my name is John Ladd. I'm president of Loud Security Systems based out of Kennesaw, Georgia, and uh, we're celebrating our 25th year in the security business this year. We have about 60% on the residential marketplace and about 40% in our commercial space. And uh, with that, I'll throw it on to the, uh, the next person. 
Hi, my name is Paul Romanelli. I'm the president of Suffolk Security Systems. We're located on the east end of Long Island, New York. Uh, we service primarily 80% residential and 20% commercial in both uh, the heating and cooling worlds and security worlds. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Todd Santiago. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Vivint Smart Home, uh, headquartered in Utah. Um, we cover 97% of the zip codes in the U.S., primarily residential, security, and smart home. Um, I head up all the different revenue channels at Vivint, our direct-to-home inside sales, our retail, and our new dealer program that we're launching as well. So excited to be here and hope we can add some value and perspective during these tough times. Hi, my name is Jack Tester, I'm President and CEO of Nextstar Network. We're a business development and training organization serving the plumbing, HVAC, and electrical industries. Our membership is primarily North America and Australia, and I'm excited to be here. Hi, I'm Matt Michelle, I'm President of Service Nation. We operate the Service Roundtable, which is the largest contractor business alliance in the world. Um, we have 4,800 member companies across the US, Canada, and Australia. Vahe, you're up. Oh, sorry. I'm Vahe. I'm one of the co-founders of Service Titan. Um, we make home service management software, and um, uh, I'm happy to be here with the group. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angie Snow. I am the owner and vice president of Western Heating and Air Conditioning. We are a residential HVAC service repair replacement company out of Orem, Utah. Uh, we've been in business 25 years, and I have been in the industry. 12 years. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Hey everyone, Matt Tyner here, uh, Director of Marketing for Williams Comfort Air, Thomas and Galbraith, uh, Jarbos, and Mr. Plummer. We have three different locations, four different brands, uh, mainly in Indianapolis, Indiana, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Louisville, Kentucky, uh, doing HVAC and plumbing residential uh, service and replacement. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, appreciate the invite, Scott. Look forward to the Q&A. But my name is Josh Huck. I'm also with Williams Comfort Air, Mr. Plummer, Thomas Galbraith, and Jarbo, Jarbos with Matt Tyner, uh, residential plumbing uh, and heating concierge uh, to, to a pretty large area of the country. Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, to the audience, you can see we have a diverse a group of companies of all sizes from uh, all parts of the country here that will give us a really good, uh, I think, broad perspective on what's going on in the marketplace today. So let's talk about um, questions today. So we had hoped to take questions live during the town hall, uh, but if you've been watching the news over the past few weeks, some of uh, these uh, web-based services have had some cybersecurity challenge and a pretty good chunk of our business is in the security space. So we take cybersecurity seriously. Uh, we went to our cyber internal cyber experts and they, they asked us to adhere to a few basic security rules. So one will be the only video that will be used will be the panelists, uh, myself and the panelists. We did not open the chat window. Uh, that is one of the, uh, the issues with Zoom, which would be a way to collect live questions and we're not going to do Q&A polling live during the session. Um, therefore, we've set up a, 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 an email box that you see on the screen, comms at residio.com. If you have questions on the fly, feel free uh, to send them in. I have a couple of different communication methods going on here today. So if I get something that feels relevant to the conversation, I will try to plug it in. Um, and in addition, we will uh, try and post all of those questions with responses after the seminar on our website. I'll give you details of that by the end. And finally, during the registration process, uh, we received hundreds of questions from attendees. Most of them fit in very nicely into the questions that we uh, were hoping to ask today, but we have tried our best to weave in all of the topics that were of interest to you. So I wanna talk about for a moment how uh, at least at Residio, how we've been trying to think about approach of the market, and we call it the five C's. Um, and we're trying to follow or rally around these, these five C's internally, and that is 
you know, commit to having a COVID plan for your company, for your employees, for your customers, that is detailed and yet uh, easy to articulate so that your customers understand how you'll protect them as do your employees. Second C is communicate. Uh, feel strongly that uh, in this time where no one's quite sure what is or isn't an essential service, both our industries have been deemed by Department of Homeland Security as essential services, both security and HVAC. Your customers may not know that. I think it's completely reasonable that we communicate by any means, social, uh, web, telephone calls even, to let them know you're operational and, and ready to support. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this next topic today because it was a big part of your inbound questions, but the, the continue. Uh, the big question is, is it okay to sell? And, and um, we're going to talk and address some ideas around how it is okay to sell, even in this environment, if we do it right. And then conserve cash, right? How do we run a business where the data, some of the data you'll see today is that COVID is having some kind of impact. Um, so how do we run a business? How do we protect our existing customers and our existing base? And then finally, community, and I'll just sum that up, community support. Both of these industries are big into the community support world, uh, really at a very local level. Um, and I would say like, if you can't do business, then do good. And we'll look at some really cool best practices that have taken place there. Um, so again, if you have questions throughout, you can send them to this email address. I have a live connection, people that are reviewing them, that if they look different than the, the, the long list of questions that we've already received, we'll try and plug them in. It's not possible to get to all of them. Uh, we do have 11 panelists in total and 90 minutes and I'm already using up too much airtime. So um, I will begin uh, by kicking off uh, our first question. I'll be directing it to, to Service Titan. So, so by, let, let me set the question up a little bit. We do have both HVAC companies, we have some plumbers, we have some electricians, and we have a large number of security dealers on the call. Um, your company really has an interesting service and it collects a lot of information from HVAC contractors. And while the data uh, is HVAC centric, I really think it, it, uh, it crosses boundaries about what's probably happening in the security market as a whole. So can you share some of the insights that you've collected as you've seen the virus spread spread across the country? Sure, happy to. Uh, just for some context, uh, what Service Titan does, it's a, it's a management system for the whole business. And so our data really comes from the fact that we have uh, all of the touch points with customers, sales, et cetera. And that's what really allows us to uh, get to some of the data that I'm gonna share here. And we primarily focus on home service businesses. So if we can go to that first slide, um, what we're looking at here is the blue line represents year over year growth. Uh, and this is for the state of Washington. And the red line represents the cases of uh, COVID. And that middle point is when the lockdown uh, order came in. And so if you look at that early part of the graph, uh, Washington was having a really great year. Year over year growth was fantastic. That, that period was especially good. Uh, probably because weather was uh, uh, bad that part of year last year uh, to have that spike. But overall, it was around 20% year over year growth for the whole state. I mean, it was just amazing. And then what ended up happening is when the shutdown order came in, or at least when the anticipation started to come in, uh, there was a, a significant drop. But one of the key insights I think this data is showing us is that there's a immediate kind of drop when the COVID happens, but then it flattens out. There's a baseline of demand um, that is still there. Uh, and so that's what this, the story is with this uh, data on, on this part is that you can see it uh, kind of stabilizes out. And so year over year, right now, we're still a little bit under where we were last year. Um, but the key is that um, what we saw as the biggest hit uh, and this is for nationally, not just with uh, Washington State, was uh, the, ma the maintenance visits were the first ones to where the visits are getting canceled, not necessarily the plans, uh, because I think people are just don't want um, what they perceive as not immediately necessary for people to be in the home. However, when you look at the demand work, that's actually been holding steady. In fact, uh, it's shown a little bit of growth year over year as well. So I think that's a really important insight that people should be taking here is that there's a fundamental aspect um, of demand that's actually holding quite steady. Uh, 
Um, this next set of data is really to uh, look at what is the impact uh, of weather within this scenario? Uh, because part of the challenge that I think um, we're having as an industry is, and this is particular to HVAC obviously, is uh, how much of the business impact that we're seeing is really a consequence of, of COVID versus um, just weather. And so what we did here is the blue line represents last year's temperature for that week. The orange line represents this year's temperature for that week. And the gray represents year over year revenue growth. And so uh, if you look at, for example, Austin, you'll see that their lockdown order went in the week of uh, the A April 5th, but because they had better temperature than the year before, their average revenue actually went up for that week. And then similarly, the next week, when the average temperature was far below that, that was last year, you saw a significant drop happen. Uh, versus, uh, for example, in LA, where um, we see that, you know, this last week, the temperature was roughly the same, but there was a demand increase. I think one of the really interesting ones is Phoenix, because with Phoenix, we see that overall weather has been um, pretty mild, especially compared to last year. And so there's a overall uh, dip in top line revenue. However, when you dig in and you look at the different companies, there's a huge difference between some companies that are um, doing really well, which I think is where we can get a lot of learnings from, uh, versus some companies that have retreated and they're actually uh, experiencing most of the pain. And so I think this is where uh, one of your seeds of communication is really one of the key differentiators here is those companies that uh, are able to get the message out there that they're still open um, is one of the big differences. And then the other one, at least that I've seen anecdotally is those business owners that demonstrate leadership and really take uh, uh, control of the situation to the extent that they have it and do things to react very much aligned with the five C's that um, we touched on earlier. Those are the companies that are seeing the most success. Uh, and there's a variety of things uh, that you could be doing. And uh, I think we've all tried to contribute in our ways of, of putting together kind of best practices. And, you know, we've, we've published some content on our website as well. Uh, but I think Phoenix is a really uh, telling story because it really shows that you don't have to succumb to this uh, feeling of doom and gloom. There are companies that are being successful, even in a city like that, where they're not only dealing with COVID, but they also have a weather disadvantage. But I think the most important question to ask as an industry is if this fundamental demand is holding steady, uh, what's going to happen when the heat arrives, which inevitably it will, and especially given the trends of warmer and hotter summers, uh, and this year is supposed to be the hottest ever, um, what's going to happen to demand when that comes in? And so if we extrapolate the data and push it out, uh, I think we could expect a pretty meaningful increase on the demand side. Thanks, Ahi. That's uh, especially on your first slide, where as the virus breaks out, we have heard from the security channel that a similar thing happens, that they see an immediate impact and then a leveling off. Um, so I think the data supports both, uh, both sides of the marketplace. So when I, um, the questions that were submitted overwhelmingly talked about how do I protect employees? How can I protect customers? What if employees uh, refuse to come to work? How do I deal with that? Um, and it's very much, in my opinion, fits very much into this commitment uh, marketplace. So, so Jack, do you have advice for, for dealers that have this challenge, not quite sure how to approach the this new era with customers and employees? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, good question and interesting data that Vahe shared. And I think some of what I'm gonna talk about will speak to that variability between companies in the same market. Is first, you know, the, the first safety consideration, um, well, there's a lot of them, but one of them that I'm gonna to speak to is what happens when that employee enters the home? You know, what do we do as leaders to make sure that this essential service is done safely? And, and really as a, as a leadership priority, it's procuring PPE equipment and make, not just getting it and giving it to your team and making sure they have it every day. It's making sure they know how to use it right. You know, in our business, all of us have standard operating procedures on how to run our business. And, and often, uh, if we had a hidden camera on our employees, we kind of see that there's kind of variable compliance with these in good times. 
And there's a lot of reasons for that. But uh, I got to tell you right now, there's, there's no leadership reason why there should be any variability in compliance with the way we enter a home. So really, this is really critically important right now that, that every company that enters a home has a standard operating procedure for how that's done. And it's not that complex. There's great information out there on, online. And uh, just, just very simply talk about this because we don't have the right to, to sell. We don't have the right to run a call. We don't even have the right to run a recall until we get this right, right? So just a quick example of how this works is you know, teaching your team specifically and then watching and, and having them demonstrate to you that when they, when they get out of the truck on, in the home, but as they arrive on the, on the job, they sanitize their hands right there. They knock on the door, they step back six feet for sure. And we're teaching this prescriptively. The customer answers the, the door, they say they confirm why they're there and say, Mr. Tester, while I'm here, I'm gonna go through some safety things that, that we have to deal with right now, given the situation. Would that be okay? They sanitize their hands right in front of the customer again. They take gloves right out of a box, they don't have them on already. They put them on right there in front of the customer. They put a mask on, they put goggles on, they, finally they put their foot covers on. They show where they'll put their discarded stuff at the end of the call in a sanitary bag that's right there with them. And they say, and I'll clean the work area when I'm done. And what other safety concerns do you have today? And then that gives them the right to enter the home. Because we can't predict, we can't know where the customer has been, who they've come in contact with, and we don't even know where our employees have been. But we can control that initial interaction. And we can get really good at that. And we can kind of get obsessive about this as an operator of a business. We got to get a little bit nuts, more so than, than we did in the past, because it's not an issue of making sales and it's not about making sure there's brand consistency and a brand experience and any of the lofty strategic goals. It's all about safety right now. And we got to get good at that. So that's the first thing I'd say in this area is focus at that initial contact with your field team. And it will give your team the confidence to continue to work and it will give your customers uh, the trust and confidence to do business with you. So I'll leave it at that right now, but there's more here. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Hey, hey Josh, I'm lucky. I live in one of the cities uh, that one of your brands plays in, so I've gotten to see some of the things that you've done. I've seen them on the news. I've seen them on social. I feel like Matt and I have become buddies on, on social media. The, uh, can, can you talk to how you've kind of worked with employees and, and your customers about going in the house? Yeah. Um... Much to some of the data Baje was saying and really tester because we're a, you know, we're an avid next door member. Um, we employed a lot of common sense with, uh, you know, our messaging. So number one, it was communicating, you know, our vision and, and uh, I'm not present, but my brother uh, um, is, and he, he's very clear and succinct and when he, when he messages. So uh, getting a top down message was pretty important. Uh, number one during the two levels of, you know, stage one of panic, it was more, um, um, we're blessed because we're a plumber and heating and cooling company. So our plumbers always have employed more PPE as a general rule. So having access to masks and gloves was kind of second nature to us, but um, really it was uh, step one, control the panic of, do I have a job? You know, so prior to the stimulus, uh, messaging very clear, uh, tactical let messaging about family medical leave and the ownership is going to guard you, um, you know, and we broadcasted a plan, uh, you know, of how, how much money we had and how long it could take. And then we were blessed with the stimulus to really, really help us get, get by. Then came in our marketing, uh, who you'll hear in a minute, um, was, a, a, you know, change our television commercials, say, say thank you, um, use Vahe software to, you know, before every service call, you get this little text message. Um, we made a video to back up what Jack said to set a clear expectation of what we're telling the client and we expect that. Um, I got really inspired, Jack, uh, you know, cause you added a couple bits in there that we missed. Um, and then just, you know, rolled out the PPE, set those examples, told the clients over and over um, what to expect. Um, so a lot of internal and external things that are all in harmony. So harmony was the key from a vision from the top down. Thanks, Josh. And then Jay, you, uh, right, Brinks is one of the largest uh, players in the security space. I, I don't know the number of people you have on the road, but I expect uh, it's large. How do, you, how do you manage through that? Yeah, so I think Jack had a great uh, list and, and Josh followed up. 
the only thing that we've done in addition to kind of what was discussed was um, when we're scheduling service jobs um, or equipment ads with the customer, we do go through a, um, a series of questions um, and then that's followed up by the technician before they arrive at the job and then again when they arrive at the job. So kind of to Jack's point about um, being a little bit nuts, um, we, I think customers appreciate, um, <coughs> always appreciate us being very diligent um, in that pursuit and ensuring, you no, know, really it's not a time where you have to be too concerned about offending someone by being overly cautious. I think they would appreciate that. From a um, more of a corporate office standpoint, we do have you know almost a thousand employees here in our Dallas corporate office. And so for us, first and foremost, it was extremely important to ensure that our employees recognize um, that their health was of the utmost important to us. And so while we could have operated with essential personnel you know, designation in our corporate building, even here in, in Dallas, um, it was more important for us to quickly mobilize our workforce to be work from home. And um, you know, great partnership with our internal departments in IT and HR that we're able to mobilize our workforce very quickly. And so we do have a substantial number of our uh, corporate positions, but also our call center positions working from home. Again, something that hopefully kind of helped instill with our employees that we, we did take the extra step to do that, um, something that we didn't have to do, but it was more important for their health that we were able to um, you know, ensure that we were practicing social distancing and ha have those customers work, our employees work from home. Great, thanks Jay. And then Paul Romanelli, uh, you're in the epicenter, right? You have a different perspective on you know, what's going on out there than, than probably anybody else. Can you, can you talk to you know, how you're dealing with it in your market? You're on mute. getting used to all the new technology in, in the Zoom world, right? <laughs> so we were, of course, hit, uh, hit early and hard with uh, coronavirus and, uh, frankly, quite scary. Our little township alone of 22,000 people had uh, some deaths right away that made the national news. And, of course, my territory is the eastern end of Long Island, which is uh, a location that a lot of second homeowners from New York City come to in the summer months. Uh, and now they've come here to quarantine themselves and left New York City. They've also spread the disease out here as well. And um, it's been a little scary uh, to, to say the least. Um, I think the one thing we did first and foremost, and I, I, the word I use probably more so than anything all day long is transparency. Right. So we are completely transparent with our employees. We're completely transparent with our clients as well. We let them know how we're working, what we're doing, what we won't do. And uh, making sure that our employees know that their safety is paramount. If they're in an uncomfortable situation, we're not going to put them in there. Um, it doesn't matter. We'll work through all of those. Uh, and the first thing we did after, of course, getting everybody to work from home and set up our offices was um, we blasted all our customers with an email, letting them know exactly how we're working, how we broke up our central station. So 85% uh, uh, of our central station workforce is working from home, and yet we still have all the protection and coverage. All of our employees are working from home, with the exception of myself and one other person. Um, and, and we let people know this all up front with the same aspect that also making them aware that their coverage, their security, their life safety is not at risk, uh, that we're still covering them the way we, we have to. Uh, it's been really, really important on our, on our side. Thanks, Paul. Hey, Jack, I wonder if I could throw you a surprise follow up. Um, so we did get, and I don't know if you have advice, uh, this is kind of a slippery slope question, but I'll, I'll throw it out there. Uh, we did get a lot of questions around how, you know, some employees are, are uh, afraid and how do I deal with an employee who doesn't want to go into a home? How do I interact with that employee? Do you have any advice around that? Well, you know, real concern. We've heard that a lot. First, they don't have to, right? They're, you know, everybody's got the right right now to, to be safe and, and, and they have to be reminded, we have to remind them, we understand that. But then we have to talk one-on-one -on -one with them to understand their concerns. Because you know everybody's experiencing this pandemic, 
but not everyone's experiencing the pandemic the same way. So everybody's got a different perspective. Everybody might have a, a loved one at home. They might just be a little unsettled. Maybe they're not even thrilled with your leadership to this point. You know, why risk it? I don't really care that much for you. You gotta figure that out, right? So the, the primary thing is to have the conversation um, and to understand what their concerns are. I think if you go back to a lot of the conversations we've had so far here, talk about the steps the company's taking, right? Not berating them, but just saying, here's what we're doing to make sure that it's as safe as it can be. Uh, you're an essential employee, we value you. Our customers need us. Um, let's talk about that. And you gotta take it kind of person by person, case by case, Scott. That's the best advice. I wish there was a blanket, this is how you do it. Here's the old one too. But uh, there really is a, a, what I've heard from, from people doing this is uh, they sit down and they do one-on-ones with employees that have concerns and they address them specifically and individually. And they do it every week to make sure that nothing's brewing in their head, right? So we're a big proponent of doing weekly one-on-ones with employees where this stuff can kind of be smoked out if there's a concern. And again, going back is we don't have, to, no one has to do anything. They don't want to right now. Right. Thanks, Jack. That's uh, really insightful. I appreciate that. We're going to flip to the communications piece of the uh, uh, question. So, and again, we're going to pull up some data from, from Vi at Service Titan. And Vi, maybe you can talk to us about what you're seeing in success rates from customers that are actively engaging with consumers right now or homeowners. Yeah, so um, what we're looking at here is um, our, our customer base uh, being split into two groups. One group is um, the using uh, one of the tools that we offer to outbound communicate with their customers. And then the other one is not. Uh, and um, I think what's really important here is not just to kind of uh, discuss the fact that you should be communicating with your customers, but to the exact same points that everyone here raised, it's what are you communicating? And the same conversation we just had about technicians and their concerns, I think the same exact thing exists on the consumer side. And so when I look at our customers that are the most successful, it's the ones that are not only just communicating with their customers that they're still available, that they're here to serve, uh, and all the precautions that they're taking to keep their employees safe, them safe, but to reinforce it at every possible touch point. Because uh, let's just be honest here, like this is top of mind for everybody, and it's gonna make a difference for some folks as to whether or not, um, not just did they do business with you in terms of generating the, the opportunity in the first place, but uh, you know, their willingness to, to buy overall. And so what we see here is that even though the broader uh, external factors are still impacting those that are doing these communications and not, what we notice is that there's roughly a 5% on average impact in terms of if you are doing these communications, generally speaking, it's, you're going to grow 5% faster or, or higher year over year rather than if you're not doing these communications tools. And this is across thousands of contractors. This isn't just uh, one or two uh, sporadically here and there. And so the data is pretty clear that uh, this is making a big impact. And I think um, being uh, very crisp on the messaging and really being empathetic about who you're serving and what they're gonna be caring about and giving them that confidence that you're doing everything humanly possible to keep them safe and that you're also available and here to serve them should they need you. Uh, because what everyone needs to remember is that the fundamentals of the industries that we serve have not changed. People still need heating, they still need cooling, they still need plumbing. That has not gone away. If anything, the demand should be going up with more people in the home. And so the question is, what can people do to best position themselves? And communications is absolutely critical when it comes to that. Thanks, Ahi. And, and I'm going to flip a similar question to, to Matt and Michelle. Matt, you have a uh, interesting perch over a large number of contractors. Um, can you talk to maybe what you've done differently or what you've seen work out in the marketplace in terms of you know, driving success through communications? Well, first, there, there's three fronts that you've got to look at. There's communication with your team and the best contractors that, that um, or the contractors that have had the most success very quickly got on the horn with their team they brought them in or they communicated with them remotely. Here's what we're doing. Here's what's going to happen. Um, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. 
and it's natural for people to fill in a, a vacuum with their own narratives, which are always worse than reality. So the first thing is to communicate, communicate what's going on and then start communicating the expectations. But it's not just with your team. You've also got to communicate with the public, with the, with the consumers and your customers. And, and again, we talked about it. The messaging has got to be, hey, we're open for business. Um, here are the steps we're taking to protect you. Uh, you know, if you are interested, here are some products that might be worth considering during this time. And some of the ones that, that we seem to, to have some resonance with, certainly it's IAQ on the HVAC side. Um, there has been a run on, on add-on bidets on the, um, on the plumbing side, and that kind of goes with the run on toilet paper. Um, and also water purification. You know, right now people are concerned about health and sanitation. Now we talked about three fronts of communication, that's two, the third is to the suppliers. Um, so you should also, you know, you've also got to communicate with your suppliers, um, understand what they've got available, understand, make sure they understand what your needs are, and make sure that they understand uh, that your expectations for keeping your team safe, because you can't afford to lose a crew in this time. Uh, you know, if you lose a crew, they're out two weeks. That's a pretty, pretty big um, uh, hit. So, so the, the main thing is communicate relentlessly, communicate expectations up and down the channel, um, and, and be honest, and as, as people have said, be open and transparent. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, John Loud, your, uh, Georgia has been in the news the past couple of days. Um, so how have you been dealing with, uh, it was also one of the early states that got a big hit. I think Albany, Georgia is one of the worst hit parts of the whole country. It doesn't get as much news as some of the big cities, but uh, how, how are you dealing with communicating with customers? Uh, thank you, Scott. I think, uh, boy, when I, Matt, you're right on the mark. I mean, starting with your team as far as that communication, but I think Jack Tester even covered it so very well. And two words that jumped out of my mind from what I heard Jack share was about obsessiveness being obsessive with the commitment, but now to communicate that obsessive commitment. So I've gotta be obsessive about my communication, not only to my team, like Matt just said, but to my consumers, not only the ones that I'm on my way to, and let's talk specifically, all right, how am I communicating? So whether it's um, social media, newsletters, obviously we're at that point in time of the month for us where we're coming out with our next newsletter. So in a general broadcast, we're doing that. In a general email that we've sent out to our entire subscriber base to know, hey, we're aware of what's going on here, are the steps that we're doing to take care of that for you. But then the next step for us is that as we're engaging with the customer and saying we're on the way, <clears throat> excuse me, typically we've sent an email to give them a picture or a bio about the technician or about the sales rep. So we're going a little bit further now to have that email to be looking a little different because we're reminding that consumer who they're going to see and what they're doing for preparedness. And this is a two-way discussion in the communication. One is what we're hoping to see in that environment, that there's nobody that has been exposed to COVID-19 or has like symptoms. And we're reassuring them that we are sending somebody that's not exposed or recently has been. We've done the temperature. And as Jack kind of rattled off that list of specific examples that we then can be able to communicate to our subscriber to have the opportunity to get into that home or that business. But so obsessive communication about that commitment, I think is uh, certainly the step and those are the areas we've been moving forward with our communication. Right, and then Jack, I'll come back to you again because you also have a perch uh, above many, many contractors. So what, what do you see that's working in terms of you know communications or best practices around talking to customers? Well, I think the, the thing is, is that, that you know, we know we're an essential industry. I don't know if our consumers automatically think that too. And so we need to communicate with them just to, hey, we're open, you know, we're here, you know, um, making phone calls to them just in many cases, just saying, you know, I want you to know we're here to serve you. Um, and, you know, reminding them that, that a lot of people are home now. This is a good time to do things too. So it's, it's just being, making sure they, they're aware to the various channels of, con of, of communication, whether that's mass media, whether that's our, uh, online presence, whether that's outbound activity, what Vahe said for sure, outbound activity, you're getting them at home now. They'll, they'll pick up the phone, they're there, they'll listen. Okay, thanks, Jack. And now let's talk to, um, hey, Paul, again, you're in a very interesting marketplace and you referenced kind of the note you pushed out to the customers. Um, uh, you know, I was lucky to get a copy of that. It was, it was uh, frankly moving. Can, can you just talk to uh, my, my recollection was you mentioned you were an essential service. 
Uh, you talked about what you're doing in the community. You talked about what the homeowner might be thinking about, even now offering donations. Can you talk about like the reception that that kind of approach received? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, uh, Scott. The um, so that was our first uh, email that went out actually uh, just a little less than a month ago. And, and honestly, the stress of this feels like it was uh, a year ago. I mean, right? We've all been working longer hours and dealing with the stress of, of the situation. But we wanted to get something out to our customers about how we're going to work, what we won't do, what we will do, and making sure that their general well-being was cared for as well. I also happen to be the chairman of a fundraising committee for our local hospital. Um, I've been on that board for several years. This past year, I became chairman. It's a gi giant responsibility for fundraising. And naturally, of course, in the middle of coronavirus, I have the luck of being the chairman uh, this year. So um, the last paragraph of, our, of the email that we sent to our client base, uh, I told everybody about my position. And if it was within their means to make any kind of a donation at all to the hospital, I put a link on that email uh, for our local hospital's donation page. We had created a COVID-19 action fund uh, to generate uh, any kind of um, donations from the community. Um, in less than 48 hours, my customer base had donated almost $20,000. And uh, since then, um, through that and some other marketing uh, within uh, the community, my customer base alone has donated over $250,000. So it's been a really uh, phenomenal outreach um, to the community. And frankly, it's something uh, that we're all in business for, right? Every one of us has a business within a community. We live, work, and breathe in these communities and serve the people, go to their restaurants, whatever that we work with. And uh, I've always felt it was an important part of our business to make sure that uh, that we were there for the community as they've been there for us in supporting our business. Thanks, Paul. Um, so let, let's, let's go to another topic that was also one of the um, largest questions coming in from uh, the regist registrants. Uh, and I'll caution the panelists that uh, this is, we're kind of getting into the meat of it now. We're probably running a little bit behind. So um, if we can uh, tr try and get back on track, that'd be great. So I, Listen, here's the reality, right? People like me, like us, like almost everyone on the call here are in this unusual work from home environment. Um, you, you know, we, we listen to the news and the amount of tests, the amount of infect, infected people. We hear about asymptomatic people uh, carrying um, and maybe infecting others. And it's, it's, I would think at least put the idea in some homeowners' minds that uh, maybe they don't want to hear from a contractor or maybe they don't want somebody into their home. Um, or maybe just receiving that telephone call might be thought of as tone deaf. So um, Jack, what, what do you think? Do you think it's okay to sell right now? Well, let's talk about a, just kind of a few things. I think, you know, I, I said before that everyone's experiencing this pandemic, but not everyone's experience of the pandemic is the same. And a lot of people lost jobs. You know, they're holding on to money tight. You know, some people are just working from home. You know, some people are very frightened for themselves or for loved ones, and some this is just an inconvenience. And so often we think that, that the mindset of one is the mindset of everyone. So it's important to keep that in mind here, that, that we, and the reason I say that is that we have an essential service, right? That, that people can't go for long without it. And so those things taken in mind here is we still have to do our job, right? We still have to be entering homes. And I know there's a temptation just to go in right to the customer says it's a air conditioner isn't working. We go back, find a contact, we replace it out the door. Right. But I don't know that that's in their best interest right now. The fact that there's a pandemic going on doesn't remove us from the responsibility of offering a thorough service to our customers. Um, we need to fully diagnose their situation and that's not easy to do. And sometimes we've got to go to all parts of the system. That's an inside unit, the outside unit, the controls, filtration, airflow. I could go on and on here, but it doesn't serve the customer to go in and replace a part, finding out that it's something completely different. 
So pandemic or no, we still have this obligation to be professionals and do a great job. And if you call that selling, I don't, I call it really educating. It's mm -hmm. making a great diagnosis. It's then communicating that diagnosis to customers, right? So that doesn't go away, that doesn't change. I think, uh, you know, our business is, is, the obligations we have is the same. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of customers are going to great lengths not to spend any money right now. And sometimes I think, and this goes to maybe a conversation we had before we got online here, that, that we've always had this issue in our industry of whether we should sell, if you will, or whether we should offer anything more than a basic repair. And um, I think it's important for us to remember that our obligation as professionals is to give the customer a range of options and let them choose whether that's a basic repair because they've you know, got low on money, they're really worried, or if it's to take some uncertainty out of an uncertain world by just replacing their system right now. That's a legitimate option that we don't need to make that choice on behalf of customers right now. So I'm gonna say with great conviction that our, our role as service professionals hasn't changed. If we're doing all the PPE stuff we talked about, we're communicating, we're making sure we're diligent about that, we're getting access to the home, we're then having a contactless experience with the customer. Uh, we can still then, I'm not going to call it selling, I'm just going to call it offering options and then letting the customer choose. And I, I guess the final thought around this is, it all is our mindset. If we enter that home with the idea that we're going to honor and serve the customer, not sell and make a commission, but honor and serve the customer. If that's really our mindset and we can drive that into our field staff right now more than any, ever, but it's that way all the time. We're going to honor and serve them. And what does that look like when we run a sales call or a service call or do an installation? That's what I'll say about that. Thanks, Jack. And and, and uh, Todd Santiago from uh, Vivint, the Larry of a very large organization. Uh, I think I think you said ninety seven percent of uh, zip codes are covered. Um, are you out actively selling? Do you um, do you see it? Or you know, are your salespeople uncomfortable or comfortable? How are you seeing a customer response? Well, I think it's a great question. And I think, um, are we still selling? Yes, we absolutely are. But we're, we're doing it differently than we normally do. And so, you know, as long as there are willing buyers and we have an essential service, we're going to continue to sell, but we're doing it as socially responsible as we can. And so we paused uh, and suspended our direct to home efforts. We've got thousands of people that go and, and go door to door. We've suspended that for the time being. And when we do begin doing that again, hopefully in the coming days and weeks, we'll do it very differently. We'll do it with flyers. We'll do it with, you know, six feet from the door. We'll do it with, with masks on our neck that, that we ask if the customer would feel more comfortable, we put the mask on. We'll do it with hand sanitizer and, and you name it. We'll be very, very cautious and we'll do a lot of, you know, we're training people to sell on the doorstep rather than go into the home and do, and do more, you know, virtual walkthroughs and those types of things. But there's demand in the marketplace. There's significant demand. And when we have crises like this, you know, we keep saying here that we, let's don't let a good crisis go, crisis go to waste. We're trying to figure out how to innovate, how to change the way we go about selling. I mean, that's what I wake up uh, and thinking about and go to bed sleeping and thinking about is how do we change the way we are offering our services to customers? And truth is demand is really high. Uh, we were selling extremely well in the beginning until we pulled people off. And now the phone is ringing a lot. We've shifted resources to, to more and more of our online uh, demand gen and digital marketing, which is extremely robust. We're ahead of plan. It's, it's going really, really well because customers are saying, hey, we want this service. And then we explain to them that we will come. And if we do come into their home, we'll do it very socially responsible. Um, and we'll be, you know, we, we do uh, uh, temperature checks every morning. We have tests that we are now sending out to the field to have our people tested as frequently as possible as testing becomes more available. So we're, we're doing it a little bit differently. And then, and then we're doing things we haven't done before we, or haven't done very well. And we've got a large customer base and everybody on the call, you have customers. So, well, we're, we're reaching out to our customers and increasing the bounty for referrals. We're, we're calling them to see how things are going. And is there anything else that we can help them with? And we're getting a, a significant increase in referrals. Uh, we're going to our employee base and saying, hey, friends, family, let's, let's, let's reach out to your network and let's provide some, some nice incentives to our employee base to go get new customers. So uh, are we selling? Absolutely, we're selling. 
differently than, than we have in the past, but these are muscles that we're developing that will really benefit us when we exit this crisis. And so that, that's kind of how we're looking at it. Um, and I appreciate what Jack said. We you do it in a kind of an honest and a, 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 a good intent uh, and you do it socially responsibly, then, then we should, and we look at this as saying, when this thing starts to slow down, we're gonna exit this, this crisis in a significantly better position than we've ever been. Um, not only on a kind of uh, a new muscle of, of being frugal and really watching the, 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 the budget, but also how do we sell? How do we sell more uh, you know, creatively and innovatively so that, so that we can keep adding customers to the platform but do it in a way that we respect those that are that are that are nervous and are afraid or or more budget conscious. We're looking at different price points. We're we're looking at other services we can offer. We're partnering with other companies that have in-home home, home services, and we're cross-selling and we're we're working with partners to give them bounties to cross-sell our service and vice versa. And so we're doing things that that actually have me really excited. Um, that once this thing ends, we're going to be in great great shape. So those are some thoughts we have. Yeah, thanks, Todd. That's awesome. I have a general feeling that a lot of companies are trying new and different things, and some of those new and different things are going to work, and they will become standard regardless of virus or not, and it'll be just another way to, to, to drive growth. Um, Melissa from Custom Alarm, how about you? Are you seeing a kind of similar customer response? Um, yeah, thanks, Scott. I would concur with uh, some of what Todd said and even what Jack was saying. I mean, we're finding that we're needing to adapt to um, interact with our customers in the safest way possible, you know, following the CDC recommendations, practicing as everybody's doing social distancing, um, wearing masks and other PPE. Um, as far as how we're in it, uh, interacting with the customer themselves, we're, we're doing virtual meetings if we need to on the, on the front end, or in some cases, customers um, will go to their house and if they're not comfortable with us coming into their house, we'll do a kind of a perimeter assessment so it allows us an opportunity to um, really assess that way. And then the customer gives us feedback what's going on in the house. Or we'll do like FaceTime or virtual meetings where they can kind of walk us through the house so that we can see what their, their area of vulnerability is or what their needs are. Uh, we're also seeing, I think just with a lot of people being home, as, as the other gentlemen have said, um, the needs still are there from a security standpoint. Um, actually, I think there are different potential security risks with a lot of people working and then having young kids or kids of different ages maybe um, playing about the house. So, you know, water sensors, um, protecting certain parts of your house, whether it's um, you know, medicine cabinets, gun areas, things like that, that people maybe didn't think they needed to worry about as much as before. Um, so those are things that are really important. So we're, we're communicating in a lot of different ways as the other gentleman had also indicated through um, social media, through our website, through email or doing um, just some social, a lot of things on social media, just to um, let people know that we are here, we're open for business and to help protect them. Really, our motto is really provide peace of mind to our customers and what that looks like is different for everybody. So we're just trying to adapt and make sure that we can be there in the safest way possible for our employees and for our customers. Thanks, Melissa, I appreciate that. And, and Jay uh, from Brinks, again, another large sales org um, how are you approaching it right now where maybe homeowners are a bit more sensitive? Yeah, so I think the, the answer to the question is yes, but I think it applies to just like we've talked about every other aspect of, of the situation during COVID, which is you've got to adapt to the current situation. So for us, um, we are, with our existing base, we're seeing actually a higher demand now for additional equipment and, and the opportunity to upsell and cross-sell with our base now, uh, even more so. So I, I would definitely agree with the others that the demand is there. I think it just comes to how can you modify your approach with consumers and take into account what their concerns may be. So for example, we have the opportunity to, to do DIY and drop ship equipment for those consumers who, you know, maybe traditionally would do a professional install of a piece of equipment, but because of the current situation, they, they don't maybe want a, a technician in the home. We have the opportunity to do that. So we can help them with that self-installation. I've also been very impressed with our dealer partners. Um, some of those individuals have modified their approach, whereas you know door to door is uh, obviously frowned upon for the most part and, and prohibited in in, in many areas. Um, and they've modified, you know, maybe their traditional approach of door to door sales, and they've gone to a do it yourself 
um, you know, whether it's uh, contacting through email and phone, but also actually do it, maybe a guided installation for consumers through Zoom, through FaceTime, through other media. So I've been impressed with some of our dealer partners who have been able to adapt quite uh, quickly. Thanks, Jay. And then Angie, how is it going in Utah? Well, well, you know what? We have just really been looking at this as an opportunity. And I think it, it goes back to what Jack said. It starts with your mindset. Is this going to be, what's the intention that you're taking into the home? Are you taking an intention of, uh, of fear? Are you taking an intention of leadership? Are you taking an intention of safety? Like, think about what that is. And really as leaders in our company, we need to communicate that to our team and set that tone for our team. And, and they will carry it out. At our company, we have taken a lot of extra time to prepare our CSRs, who are speaking with the clients, who are booking the calls. When someone comes in, calls in and has a concern, they are very well prepared to talk to the client, to listen to the client, to be more empathetic at this time. This is a great opportunity for us to really strengthen our relationships with our current clients that we have right now, because this will pass and business will go on. Will it be the same? No, it won't be the same as it was before. We're all adapting and that is, that is what will equal success. If we find a way to adapt that can work for us and for our clients, but then communicating that to the clients and reassuring them and keeping that connection so that they'll continue to trust us and, and work with us um, throughout this and on into the future. Thanks, Angie. Matt, let me change it up a bit for you, if I can. If I look at the list of, again, about 150 or so questions that we received on the registration, and even some that are, are coming up um, on my, uh, my text, there's a lot of concern about, about selling and about when will the economy come back. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to use the word negativity, right? But, I mean, there's real concern. Um, do you, in, kind of out in the world, see any reasons where there should be some optimism? Extremely optimistic about this year. Um, just look at the numbers. So if we, if we look at 2019 in, for the HVAC industry, industry installations um, were up just, I think, about 150,000 units. But if we back up 15 years before that, and we look at 2004, 2004 saw an, about a 9% increase over the year before. That was about 600,000 installations. We should have seen a bigger jump last year. Why didn't we? Well, we didn't because we had a late summer uh, and, and the late summer caused uh, replacements to be deferred into this year. And then if we back up 15 years from this year, we saw the record sales for the industry ever. It was 8.6 million units. That represented a 16% jump from the year before. Um, you know, there's only so far that you can put off a replacement. And these are going to be coming up. And now, now we've also got this situation where people aren't going on cruises. They aren't going to Disney. They're stuck in their homes. They're running their air conditioners flat out. They aren't setting them back. They're, they're straining them harder. And they're going to have some money in their pockets if they've got jobs um, because, because um, uh, they aren't going to be traveling and they aren't going to be going on vacation. And if we, we look at the March unemployment numbers, which weren't good, but 67% of the unemployment occurred in the travel and hospitality industries. So, you know, these are, are renters, not owners for the most part. So, you know, I'm, I'm still optimistic. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of compressors out there that are not going to make it through the summer and we're going to replace them. Great. And, and John Loud, I know, um, I know you have some interesting thoughts here. You and I have been talking over these past couple of weeks. Yeah, Scott, I'll, I'll take it. But you know what I want to touch on? Angie Snow just said it so well. You know, when you think about optimism, I'm wired as a positive, optimistic type of person. That's kind of the way my thinking goes. But I love what Angie said. You know, how do you find this situation and create an opportunity? How do each one of us out there on that call listening today thinking, where's the opportunity that I can find going on in my marketplace or within my business? And I'm talking about beyond cleaning out the garage and the basement and the attic and the, in the kitchen drawer. So two parts for us, one very short for the alarm industry folks. For us, we went out and started to tackle our, our communication uh, path changeovers. So we realize all of us have 
hundreds, if not thousands, like many of us, have got to begin that process now. So back in February, we started to order out of fear of supply chain. We, when when uh, China started to shut down some elements, I had concern we were going to start to lose product. So we started a back order and say, let's get this product in our warehouse to be able to deal with changing as many of these units we can. We know today, not everybody's gonna let us in their home, not everybody's gonna let us in their business. But I'll tell you, being a month plus six weeks into this, we're having great success to keep our employees uh, paid and out in the workforce to be able to keep that going. But another one I shared with you, Scott, and I want everybody, this is HVAC, everybody to be able to think about. Here's the biggest opportunity that we all have because we're all in a unique type of business where service contracts and the type of product, think about safety and comfort, right? Safety from air control, safety, security, and comfort, peace of mind that's going on. The PPP program. There are a lot of businesses out there, like many of ours, that are able to apply because we have the right to apply. We can get funded. Now, we have a lot of money coming our way that maybe we're not going to need to, uh, we're going to use the government's money to pay payroll, to pay our lights and electricity and our internet and our telephone. But guess what that means? We don't use our cash. So start to think differently and be optimistic. Think about those companies out there that have not been devastated by 50% or 80 or 90%, but may have only been hit by a 10% hit here. So for the security world, think about those that have talked about camera upgrade projects, access control improvements that they've considered. From the HVAC side, look, I've had to replace two of my top roof units over the last year. I wish I had known some of you guys out there, or maybe there's somebody on the call that did that service for us. But we know that's not a, an expense that somebody's got the spare money sitting beside. But be thinking about the companies that got PPP money, maybe did not get impacted that badly. Because I know for us as a company, we're going to be investing in vehicles and some new software and do some other things. I want to get to the backside of this so that I see nothing that there isn't into it. But everybody be thinking about those customers, prospects you've talked in the past or where your sales team should be prospecting in the future. So PPP is not just a huge benefit for you, but for your customer bases that can afford our solutions that were on that call today. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just talk, talk to you. I would have saved this for a few minutes ago, but or a few minutes from now, but because you mentioned PPP, right? I believe I read last night that it was refunded. I don't know the exact amount of money, but uh, we did a similar town hall uh, two weeks ago just for the security industry. Uh, and I've sat through a lot of different town halls in the industry, and I'm surprised at how few people applied for those stimulus packages. Um, and I can list off a fairly long list of companies that not only applied, but have already started to receive money. So John, I think you're right. There are, I know many companies like yours that uh, applied for PPB have the money, but are still operational, right? They're still up and running, maybe not to the same point they were before, but you know, when you when you originally shared that with me, I uh, had not thought of it before. Yeah, Scott, I, I do Scott, think there's an opportunity. Let me share this with you too. So the new funding, everybody's going to hear that the, the president's going to sign this deal for 400 and some odd um, billion, no million, that's coming up on Thursday. So 310 million of that is for small businesses. 50 million of that is uh, actually this is billion. Sorry. So 50, excuse me, 60 billion is going to go to banks that have 10 billion in assets or less. So this is about the smaller banks, the smaller operators that think maybe I shouldn't. Do not, ladies and gentlemen, do not miss the opportunity to go in and file for PPP. The process, uh, the, the reward, the return of what it will do and the impact for you is going to be tremendous. One last one too is the EIDL. You can get up to $10,000 and you can go use that money to go buy Residio product. You can use that to, to do uh, marketing or other things. So don't miss these opportunities and I'm more than happy to help others aside after this, Scott, if you have uh, you or Jason or anybody on your team want to connect to help guide them uh, to that approach. Thanks, Sean. And, and Matt, do you have like, uh, obviously, again, with your purview over many, many contractors, um, what, what guidance can you give them along the lines of just keeping operationally fresh and funded and conserving cash and applying for PPP or EIDL or all of the various acronyms that exist around uh, the stimulus package today. Sure. Well, first, let's talk about the the Paycheck Protection Program, and and um, you know, John, you're you're you know, you're right. A million here, a billion there. Pretty soon, we're talking about government money, um, but it is 310 billion, and it, and and it is going to be made available very quickly. Um, the bankers that I've talked to expect it to be tapped out within a week. So everybody who's watching this should get your applications in now. You're going to have better success going through an SBA lender 
Uh, PayPal has an app that you can access. And for any of you that are, that are Service Roundtable or Service Nation members, um, we've got an expedited program that you can reach out to me and I'll connect you with. A uh, thing to remember is this has to be used within eight weeks. 75% of it at least has to be used on payroll. The other 25% can be used on rent or utilities. And, and you have got to maintain the average payroll that you had before you went into this, whatever that is. So, you know, apply now, um, take advantage of it, uh, and follow, you know, traditional, traditional patterns right now of, of what you're going to do for cash conservation. I mean, talk with your suppliers about, about consignment programs. Um, talk to them about extended terms. Uh, you know, just be, be smart about, about how and where you use cash, but don't cut back on your marketing. Don't cut back on, on your, your effort to put your brand out there. Uh, you know, we saw this in, in 07, 08, the companies that, that continued to step up the pressure on marketing were the ones that actually grew through the uh, recession. And they grew because other, other way we talk about it is you're, you're running against the wind. Um, you have to work a little harder to run at the same pace. And some of your competitors are, are stepping to the side of the road and resting because it's too hard for them. And you're going you're gonna to race ahead and they're never going to catch up on the gap. So, so again, just, just look at how you're using your marketing dollars. I know we've had some members who have shifted it um, from direct marketing spends to trying to do things to support uh, local businesses in their communities with matching programs. And they've gotten tremendous boost from social media. And, and you know, Facebook right now has got a 50% increase in, in activity. Um, so, so, you know, be out there. You're on mute, Scott. Finally did it to myself. <laughs> so, Todd, what kind of advice can you offer, you know, a medium-sized business out there that is feeling uh, – a cash crunch maybe right now, maybe fearful of attrition uh, in their either their service contracts or their monitoring agreements. Any best yeah, practices you might advise on? Yeah, I've got some ideas. I think I think everyone's right that they've got to approach, be aggressive about pursuing the, the government help as much as they can. But the reality is, as many of my friends are experiencing, they, they've been turned down or they haven't got those, those loans and are in a pretty tight spot. And so even though we're a much larger company, I can tell you what we did. I mean, a month ago, we formed a ta we formed a war room team of senior people at Vivint, and we locked ourselves remotely. Actually, we we're here uh, a month ago, and for about three weeks, we went into every single line item, every single budget category in our in our company, um, and went through and decided what was essential and what was not essential in regards to spend. We, we suspended credit cards of certain people, a lot, of, a lot of people. We cut spending drastically. If people have a budget, they think it's something they should spend. So we had to reconfigure everybody's budget. I mean, we literally went through line item by line item. It sounds crazy, but every two days, I get an email from my, my CFO here that has the credit card spend of everybody in my org. And I've got a lot of people in my org but I literally go through it at night after the kids are in bed, I go through and say, okay, let me just make sure that every dime we are spending at our company right now is a necessary spend. And if it isn't, we cut it. And I personally reach out to them and say, and this is about leadership too, you know, people are watching me. What am I spending? How am I behaving? What is my attitude in all of this? But when I call someone and say, hey, hey, John, or hey, Steve, or whatever, just want to verify that, you know, it looks like you spent 200 and something dollars on that. This helped me understand we're trying to be very cautious right now. Well, Todd, it was this or that. And then, you know, maybe I could have waited two or three months. Great. Hey, why don't we postpone those expenses the best we can? So I think you have to take a very aggressive hands-on approach to, to cash management because cash is king right now. And if you don't, aren't fortunate enough to get one of the loans, you're going to be grateful that you, that you conserved every dime you possibly can. Now we've got customers calling. We have a million, I don't know, a million two customers, something like that. And we get where our, our call volume has gone up a little bit. We're managing on a case by case basis, but we have found that it's better. They call in to cancel. We're looking at one, two and three month suspensions of their account. For example, we'll, we'll turn it off. And so a lot of cases we're leaving them monitoring because they're valued, they're valued customers. We're letting them keep the service because we don't want them to get used to not having the service. So we'll let them keep the service and we'll give them a one month reprieve, two month reprieve, 
three month reprieve and we categorize it, we'll call them back in a month, see how they're doing. As long as you have that communication with your customer base and they know that you're aware of the tough times they're going through and you're sensitive to it, I think we're going to keep those customers. We're going to have probably some additional attrition. Everybody's probably going to suffer that because, because of the situation. But by, by taking that kind of compassionate approach, when customers call in, we work with them. And then based on the situation, we give them a, you know, a, a one or two or three month credit, whatever it takes right now, that's what we're doing. And then we're just managing it. In some cases, we're lowering their rate slightly. Um, we're just watching it uh, customer by customer and being as sensitive as we possibly can. And so far, we're weathering it. And, I, and I'm optimistic that we will continue to weather it. But again, compassion. There's a lot of tough things going on out in the marketplace and our customers are suffering. And so we're trying to be as helpful as we can um, on a case by case basis. Thanks, Todd. That's uh, extremely valuable. Uh, hey, Matt Tyner, how about, you know, from uh, your side of the house? What, what are you guys doing or, or what um, ideas can you offer contractors like yourself that might be seeing attrition in service agreements or, um, you know, other recurring or even new installs? Right, totally. So, I, so much of what we do well and what we don't do well as an industry set is on expectation setting, right? That's the entire basis of a business being successful or not being successful. And we've just got to continually push the messaging of why we're doing things and being transparent, not only with our internal team, but with our external partners, being our clients, uh, as, as was mentioned before, even our vendors, to be able to help, help boost that message so it comes across genuine. Uh, and then just having the team in place that shows empathy to be able to uh, you know, drive that, that conversation to the right place. Um, from the spend perspective, I know we were talking about earlier, from marketing side of things, I hope you have a pretty good pulse on the marketing uh, because you shouldn't have to cut back on marketing because you should be able to understand what is working, what is not working. You may be taking more risky uh, marketing propositions during uh, certain times that may have a lower return on ad spend, but you monitor those and maybe you can cut some of those, but now is the time to be investing in the business, whether it be top of mind awareness, whether it be direct client acquisition, uh, because I can tell you from our experience, as people do drop out, because there will, will be some of your competitors that say, hey, I don't want to invest in marketing right now. That's where I'm going to cut. Um, this is your time to really be able to grow. Because one thing I noticed is our cost per lead starts going down, our cost per click, all the different variations and metrics that we monitor start going down. So it becomes cheaper for me to get more people. Uh, and that's just, that's an exciting time from a marketing perspective. And I think we'll be talking about the messaging uh, portion of it here, here in a few minutes, but uh, just be smart about what you cut. Make sure you understand what that impact is going to be because from a marketing perspective, that is the lifeline of your business, right? It goes marketing into your call center, then it goes to your team to close. Um, you've got to have that first step to be able to have the other parts of your business survive. So that'd be my recommendation there. And, uh, you know, just sum it all up, be human. That's all you can do is just be human in this entire experience. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Scott, just one thing that I think is super relevant for this time is I'm reminded of uh, Warren Buffett's famous saying <clears throat> where he basically said, be scared when others are greedy and be greedy when others are scared. And I think in this moment in time is actually just like everyone else has been saying, you can either view it from a mindset of opportunity and look to take advantage of the situation uh, or you can retreat. And uh, the lessons learned from the previous scenarios is that we fundamentally serve uh, an inelastic demand. And so it's gonna come back. It's probably gonna come back even stronger than it was before. The question is, where will you be when that happens? Thanks, Fahmi. And Jay, what, what's your approach, um, you know, within Brinks to, to just uh, conserve cash or what advice might you offer to other security companies about how they ought to be thinking about account retention? Yeah. So. Uh Looking back, and I wish we had this much insight as to what was happening, but even prior to the um, pandemic, we had actually implemented a spin control tower, something um, we had worked on, which is essentially just introducing financial discipline, financial resilience into the business. So I would kind of echo what Todd had mentioned. It is you want to kind of heighten that sense of, of preserving cash and, and uh, reducing spend where possible, understanding obviously not to sacrifice anything from a 
customer experience standpoint, but there are some times in which you have to make some tough decisions. Um, on the customer attrition standpoint, um, it, just like we talked about with employees, it, it really is a case by case basis. Um, you know, as much as you can, and, and what we try to do first and foremost is have just meaningful conversations with each customer we speak to and understand what their individual situation is. And it is, you know, very similar to what was discussed. It may be, you know, where they just need, you know, a month to, to bridge a gap. They may need a couple of months um, to get over a little bit larger uh, obstacle. And so we're really just saying, how can we work with each individual customer? And m more times than not, most likely we can work through a good situation because they do value the security. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we are able to continue to have them protect uh, their family and themselves. And so if we can obviously help reinforce the value of that security and help them through this, you know, maybe a quick financial hardship, um, we're doing everything we can to make that happen. Thanks, Jay. And, and Melissa, how, how are you approaching in, in Minnesota with your customer base? Oh, with, with ours, uh, just to add things that, that uh, others haven't said would be that um, we, are approaching with the customers that have called to potentially cancel, have offered uh, the next three months free for their monitoring, and then told them that they don't need to, you know, if they've got an outstanding balance, that they can hold on paying then if they don't have the ability to pay right now. So kind of pay if you can. Um, and if you can't, we're not incurring any late fees for them. So we're just setting that aside to just really help get them through these next couple months. And hopefully um, they'll be you know, able to pick things back up and not want to cancel, but um, we are still keeping their service going and just doing a three month free um, for those at that time. And then as far as us, um, I mean, there are a lot of great tips shared. I'd say other things that we're doing on top of all the suggestions would be just trying to pay with credit cards when we can, just to kind of extend the, the payments there. Um, and so that's a, something that I would definitely recommend. And then you know, there are some benefits to what's going on right now. Our, our travel has gone down, so that expense has significantly helped uh, be cut. And then uh, with gas prices, so with their techs out on the, in the field, they're, well, my gas bill right now is a little bit lower, so that helps in utilities since there are hardly any people in the office. So some, some nice savings that we don't necessarily have to budget for as much that are kind of happening because of what's going on. Yeah. Matt and Michelle, let me hit you with a surprise follow-up um, that came in off of the wire here, and I just received it on text. So somebody texted in a core, emailed a question in that said they've just suspended their service agreements because they feel they're non-essential. How do we do deal with a largely undelivered prepaid service that was meant to keep us busy during the shoulder season? And more specifically, what would be a best practice? Should we give them an extension, deliver the service anyway, even with the burden of summer coming or offer additional discounts or benefits in the future? Well, first, remember the reason that we do maintenance agreement. It is not primarily to keep our guys busy. Um, it is a valuable service and there has been utility research that has shown that. Um, and, and I think it will, you know, remember, it will extend equipment life, prevent breakdowns, store loss capacity, and lower uh, utility bills. So the question then is, can we do maintenance on a no contact basis? Well, as soon as this thing happened, one of our members came up with a no contact maintenance agreement to where the, the technician communicates by phone to the homeowner and the homeowner does certain things inside the house while the technician does the work outside the house. It's not perfect, it's not as good as we would normally do, but it does get some of the, the, the main things done in terms of maintaining the unit. So I would offer them that option. Um, if they still don't want to do it, if they're still um, you know, afraid, then postpone it. And if you need to postpone it in the future, go ahead. But those service agreement customers are gold. You do not want to lose them. Each service agreement customer really is a deferred, is a deferred replacement. It's a change out waiting to happen. So do all you can to, to keep that customer tied to you and do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You, know, it may, you may have to do one-offs with some of them. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, um, Matt. I appreciate that. Now I'm going I'm to flip it back to Matt Tyner for a moment because you guys have faced a similar issue um, and you took a really unique approach to it. And that is you focus some of your team on community support. And it's been from, from where I sit again in one of your markets, it's been really cool to watch. So can you walk us through some of the cool things that you've done? 
Yeah, so I guess from the beginning, uh, once the stay at home acts or orders were put into place in the three markets that we serve, uh, not only did we look at the, yes, we are, we are considered an essential business, but we looked internally what is considered essential today. And we were one of the companies that decided to pause on preventative maintenance, uh, tune-ups and inspections. And with our clients, it went over very well. Um, if someone did have a problem, we went ahead and, and serviced them. Uh, but many of them were like, listen, we completely understand we we're going to call to postpone it anyways. And we just asked them for, for this brief period of time to be able to grant some, uh, some grace on their end for us to be able to make sure that we're keeping our team and them safe. Um, now with that, then it freed up an entire fleet. And uh, with that fleet also came team members. So it was like, well, what are we going to do? We still need to get everyone 35, 40 hours. How are we going to do this? Right. And that's where the creativity and that's where this really got uh, fun just from our perspective of how we were able to positively impact the community. First thing we did, uh, we noticed there were high risk individuals that were still going to the grocery stores. Uh, that doesn't need to happen. We can help with that. So what we decided to do was anyone that was considered high risk, a healthcare worker or a first responder, um, all they have to do is they place a, with Meyer, Kroger, uh, Target, Walmart, whatever, their click list type order, call into our client care team, uh, our client care team will take their information down, the order confirmation, uh, time of pickup. Uh, we took that information, we put it into Service Titan, we set up the call. Uh, they, they're they able to know when we dispatch our uh, preventative maintenance team member to, to the grocery store. They're able to track them via GPS um, and they're able to just see um, you know, what the progress is. This is completely no contact, but it's something that we felt we were able to do to be able to again help flatten the curve because this, this virus was bigger than us. As a company, as individuals, it's bigger than us. Uh, we have, to, we have a, a, a sense of involvement and responsibility for the communities that we serve to help them. Uh, next, we've worked with the Salvation Army. We packed the other day, we packed over uh, 6,300 meal boxes for home, for um, families in need across the entire state of Indiana. Uh, we've made, ma internal teams have made masks for our, ec for our field team members, then we're donating the rest, um, the food delivery. We've done blood donations. Um, and then even don't went as far as donated some meals from uh, one of the well-known restaurants here in Indianapolis was doing a match with uh, Bob and Tom and another bank. Well, we said, hey, we can, we can help and give in this as well. So we threw in another 100 meals to be matched as well. And we're actually going to be delivering those uh, to the healthcare workers to be able to, to again, just show our, our appreciation. And all this comes down to is being human. We, we know uh, without this community, we are nothing. This is, our, this is our entire client base. This is all we exist for. Uh, if we do not serve them during this time and serve them well and serve them genuinely, we're not doing our job as a corporate partner. Um, so that's been, that's been really where we've approached it from. Our marketing has changed 100%. That was a real fun experience. I was, uh, you know, I'll joke with, with Josh because he, he and I were on the phone as my wife was getting, uh, getting ready to deliver our third baby. Um, so, so we were, we were making plans of getting all this in, 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 uh, into market and just being able to get people to understand our news partners have been phenomenal in helping us spread this word. Um, we have taken any offer that we had on TV that has been discontinued and we put a thank you ad up to be able to, uh, or commercial rather, uh, to just say thank you to healthcare worker, workers, grocery clerks, uh, delivery drivers. Um, the first responders. There's just so much, so much that we have to be thankful for, and we're just glad to be able to to experience that with them. And, I, and Scott, I, I, I want to add, I want to add real quick that circling back into PPP, you know, it was doom and gloom in that first wave of panic on cash flow for us, um, and whether you, people agree with our essential, non-essential, you know, clients were canceling. You know, it was, it was almost a no-brainer, but back to the PPP, none of that community give back and that marketing message that Matt so eloquently delivered would have happened without us uh, knowing where we could go with what the, the president of the United States had gifted us all with the opportunity to take. So I can't reiterate it enough that if you do take it, do something different back to the human element. Don't sit on hands. Cause I know my dad didn't raise us to sit on our hands for the people out there that know him. Um, and I just wanted to add that. And thanks, Matt. You really summarized all of what we did really quickly because it was a lot more.
it felt like. Yeah, yeah so I, I, and I appreciate you moving through, Pat. You, man, you have done a, a ton of stuff, and, and thanks, Josh. And, and I know all the companies on the panelists, and in fact, these two industries are really big in, in the, the community service world. The challenge we're having now is that we're not going to be able to go through them all because it's 325 and we're going to, we're going to run out of time. But I did want to get to the last question that I had. And that question is just about like, th these are challenging times and how important is, you know, personal leadership in, in this current environment. So Todd Santiago, maybe you take that one. Yeah, I think, I think this is a time to, to step up as leaders, uh, every one of you guys uh, in your companies, I think, speed of the leader, speed of the team. And, and we have an opportunity right now to, to show empathy and, and positivity and, and also really have a calming influence on our employee bases. Um, they're looking to us to determine, okay, how scared should I be? Am I gonna have a job? What's the future look like? Everything else. And I think there's an opportunity right now that we have to step up, be positive and, exp and paint the vision of what this is gonna look like down the road. I mean, I, I have remained more bullish than I've ever been about the future of our industries. These are great services. These types of times cause us to become much, much better. And it's going to be difficult. It's difficult for a lot of people. I mean, we've done salary decreases. We've, we've slashed bonuses. We've done so many things that are really hard, but we're painting the vision and making sure our employees understand and our customers understand that, that the future is bright. Uh, everything's going to be okay. We're going to weather the storm. We're going to work with everybody. We're going to be empathetic. We're going to, we're really going to, you know, have a great future ahead of us. So I think it's our, our responsibility to, to exude confidence, exude, exude optimism in spite of some of the challenges we're facing. And then I've realized that people are, are you know, even our own employees are watching us pretty closely. Um, work from home, sometimes productivity can take a massive dive. Um, it's really interesting. People are watching. How, how am I working? I actually think I'm putting in significantly more hours now than I ever have. I'm working extremely hard. I'm working more than I normally do. Um, and my team and their teams and everybody understands that now is not a time to sit back and wait to see what happens, but it's really a time to be more energetic, more engaged, more innovative, um, work with more urgency, and, and they're watching us. They're watching to see if we're going to sit idle or if we're going to really dive in and build something that's going to be able to be more sustainable and is going to be stronger after we exit. And then I just say, uh, even, you know, just on cash management, everything else, they're watching all of us. Um, and when they see the executive team or everybody else conserving cash and being really frugal and really disciplined, uh, they do the same thing. So leadership is at an all time premium right now. We've got to lead out. We've got to lead our teams. We've got to lead our customers. We've got to lead our industries uh, because demand is there. We're offering an essential service and without question, the future is really bright. And so that's the message we keep saying and, our, and uh, I'm feeling better about things than I ever have in spite of, you know, what seems to be a daily, you know, influx of bad news. There's a lot to be uh, positive about and, and excited about in the future. So those are some thoughts I have. Thanks, Todd. Um, Angie, I know leadership is super important to you personally, and, and we're down to just the last couple of minutes. I'd love to get one other person involved as well. So can you talk quickly about how you approach it? Absolutely. You know, I think everyone needs to know that you can be a leader, a leader in your company, regardless of your position, your title, whatever you're doing, the actions that you're taking, the way that you're responding the way that your, your attitude and your emotions, the way that you're handling things, it makes you a leader. So this is a great time to fortify yourself, put good into yourself, find good things to help you and empower you as a leader so that you can engage in this and not back away. Be very proactive and not reactive. Thanks, Angie. And, and Matt, just uh, Matt Michelle, if you could add one minute's worth of sure. <laughs> insight. Um, first off, lead with a servant's heart right? Practice servant leadership in this time. Uh, the, the thing is, is, as business executives, a lot of times we try to manage our way out of a crisis, but you can't manage your way out of a crisis. Management is turning to spreadsheets for the scarce allocation of, scarce, of resources. Uh, this is a time for leadership where we want to reach for the human spirit because the human spirit is unlimited and we can inspire our people. We can achieve extraordinary things with ordinary people throughout this crisis. And we can come out of this well ahead of where we entered. Thank you.
Thanks, Matt. And I'd like to thank all, all of the panelists. I know we, uh, we sped things up there at the very end in an effort to make our, our time slot. Uh, but I thank you for your participation today, uh, for the efforts. I mean, this is pretty impressive that you're offering best practices to other people in your industry. Um, it's really an unusual time and I appreciate you stepping up to do that. I also want to thank every attendee. It's not lost on me that you've invested your personal time. And I think that's a testament to how deeply you care about your business and, and your employees and your customers. Um, and finally, Residio has set up a website. If you just visit, visit residio.com, it's easy to find uh, a, cor a coronavirus update that's filled with resources, resources that have come from all over the place. It'll connect you to other websites, small business uh, administration, uh, bankers and lenders, a CARES Act input, uh, data from its industry associations from both HVAC and the security industry. So feel free to, to go there and find updates. It'll even continue to track the virus across the country. Um, I, I guess in closing, this isn't the first challenge our industries have ever faced, and it probably won't be the last, but I, I do truly believe in my heart of hearts that it takes effort and intelligence and leadership um, to create successful business practices that will work, and not only will they work in this economy, uh, in this crazy world, but as we recover, I think the things we implement now will look like incredible innovations, and maybe they'll be in product, in marketing, or in sales, or even in new ways to support the community. So it makes us really excited about what's to come. And, and finally, I'd say follow government guidelines, right? The states are approaching reopening in very different ways, but follow the guidelines. Uh, right? You know, remember the five C's, focus first and foremost on, on your health and, and safety of you, your family, your coworkers, your customers, and you know, the, the general public. Uh, again, this crisis won't last forever. Um, and I think if we all work together, uh, we can emerge as a stronger industry. So thank you for participating as panelists. Thank you for attendees, for, for, for donating 90 minutes of your time. Uh, truly appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Good luck.